All right, so now <clears throat> I'm, I've, I've steered away completely uh, from, in, in the first lecture, just from discussing some of the real common deficiencies, which I, I felt really belong in this section where we're going to talk about the nutrition of cheetah cubs and, you know, sub-adults um, uh, rather than adult cheetahs, because we see two very different things. Uh, in the young cheetahs, younger than 20 uh, months or two years, we, you know, these diseases that I'm going to discuss now are very, very common. And then in the adult cheetahs, we don't see those developing again. But then they're the kind of chronic um, problems that we see in adult cheetahs that may or may not be associated with you know, nutrition. And, um, you know, it's much more difficult to then connect it directly to a particular deficiency. All right. But in this case, we're going to really just talk about very a brief overview on felid um, nutrition, why they are quite unique um, compared to other mammals. We, we talk about obligatory carnivores. They, I mean, I had one client in the UK that uh, tried to feed, feed her cats uh, a vegetarian diet. And I mean, it is an utter disaster. I mean, I've never seen a sicker cat in my life with mycoplasma, nasal infection, upper respiratory infection. I mean, it was absolutely, um, you know, this greasy coat that was falling out in patches. And I mean, I've never seen a worse looking cat in my life. And then we used to hospitalize this darn cat and give it, you know, Hills AD, and this cat would just eat like it's never seen food before, you know, and then it would get better. But then she clearly, the lady had a bit of a psychological problem in that she, you know, then the cat would go home again, and then she'd go want to feed it a vegetarian diet again. And she knew nothing of how to try and balance a diet. I mean, I suppose you could try, try and, comp you know, compose plant materials, but it would still be very, very difficult to do, simply because these felids are really obligatory carnivores. They need um, actual uh, animal tissues. So if we look at their, their choice uh, for most uh, free-ranging felids um, in terms of protein, fat to carbohydrate, they seem to choose m more of the protein. They're going for those amino acids and the taste of the amino acids which is a little bit different to dogs where we can go about 30% protein, 60% fat, and then, you know, somewhere around the sort of 10% carbohydrate. Um, now that's 10% carbohydrate is still fairly high compared to what the free roaming cats would get where it's only about 2%. Um, and that would be in the form of glycogen that is stored in the liver and the kidney, I mean, and the muscle of the prey that they would eat. So they normally eat the entire carcass. Um, most species, I mean, as you get bigger and you get towards the lions, obviously they're not getting the entire carcass all the time. So lions would only be on a bit of a rotational basis in terms of which organs they're going to get. Uh, they're not every week, every time they get a buffalo kill, they're not necessarily going to get a piece of the liver. Um, but they would have to get some liver at some stage. Uh, but because of that, they were more likely to be robust in terms of uh, they must be able to store certain nutrients for longer, whereas the cheetah, you know, there's virtually no situation where they are going to be, they, they get the same food every single time. And most of your smaller cats, again, going down to serval and caracal, again, eating the entire carcass. Serval will eat those flay rats, makes up 90% of their diet, and they eat the whole rat. I mean, that's the whole thing is consumed. So their diet is, is really very, very consistent. It doesn't, very, you know, change that much either. Um, <clears throat> They have a limited regulation of the breakdown of, of protein, um, so they often will uh, start utilizing their own muscle tissue if they don't if they starve for a period of time. Um, they often, with the, together with the fat that they start mobilizing, they start mobilizing protein from the actual muscle tissues as well, and can lose a lot of weight because of that. They have a high nitrogen demand, and they have a large number of essential amino acids, amino acids that they absolutely need in the actual diet, and it's. In the 1960s, they did some ex very interesting experiments on cats um, using very artificial diets. And they found that uh, the one particular amino acid, arginine, if you remove arginine from a single meal in kittens, those kittens die after eating the one single meal. And the reason is that they, uh, arginine, arginine is the, 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 uh, arginine is the amino acid that they need to drive the urea cycle. So if they don't have arginine in the food that they are eating, they actually end up um, with a buildup of ammonia and they actually develop um, hyperammonemia uh, and brain, brain damage from the very high blood ammonia levels. So, I mean, that's the only like single meal with a deficiency that's going to cause you to die um, that I've ever heard of in um, the actual animal kingdom, you know. So 
it's quite dramatic, but fortunately all meat contains m more than enough arginine, so it's really never really a, it's an, an academic problem, not a, <laughs> a, a, th a real practical one. Other interesting things, um, so they, up to 45% of the energy needs obtained from fat, so they, re uh, they metabolize it incredibly well. Fat, if you put fat, a whole bunch of kilogram of fat in the one end, you get, uh, it would be, you know, maybe 50 grams of feces on the out, out on the other end. I mean, that's how efficiently 95 to 100% um, digestion takes place, so it's it's really efficiently utilized. Uh, they need dietary sources of arachidonic acid and linoleic acid. Those, as I said, are usually not really much of a problem for them. They're usually present in the animal fat tissues. They have an absolute requirement for vitamin A in the form of retinol, not in the form of beta-carotene or any of the other carotenoids that we as humans can utilize, so we can convert beta-carotene into vitamin A. They can't do that, or they, they can absorb the, the beta-carotene, but they can't actually convert it efficiently into vitamin A. Beta-carotenes obviously occur in plant tissues, uh, whereas um, vitamin A retinol doesn't occur in plants, um, and it only, you know, you don't get beta-carotenes in animal tissues. So again, a reason why they absolutely require animal tissues for that. Uh, vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, um, they, I mean, yeah, it shows you the, the way uh, we would get a lot of our vitamin D from. So you have sunlight on the skin, and that converts a, a compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol, a form of cholesterol. You absolutely do need cholesterol um, in your body. Well, this is one of the reasons why you need it to make uh, a vitamin D. But then the sun converts it into um, cholecalciferol, the vitamin D3, and the liver then converts that to 25-hydroxy vitamin D3, and then in the kidneys you get the final conversion to 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3, which is the most um, metabolically active form of vitamin D3. Now the problem is that you can take a cat, any cat, I mean species and dogs to some extent as well, you can shave them, you can put them in the sun all day, and they will not make one little bit of vitamin D3. So they don't have that enzyme to convert, or the UV-induced enzyme to convert the 7 dehydrocholesterol into the first part, cholecalciferol. So they need a dietary form of that, um, of vitamin D3. <clears throat> and we're going to talk about that um, in a moment as well. They also require taurine um, in the diet. Fortunately, it's present in most muscle meat, especially... Uh, Chickens that sit in a, in a small cage don't have much taurine in them, and that's potentially another problem with, with chicken. Whereas a, a beef cow that walks a long distance or a horse that's using muscle, muscles that are very active produce or have a lot of taurine in them. Actually, the, the masseter muscles in, in ruminants, because they ruminate and they, use their, they, they have to chew the, the cud all the time, those actual muscles have very high taurine levels and heart muscle, which works very, very hard, will always have taurine in it. Niacin, vitamin B3, um, they also uh, require dietary um, supply of that, and then we talked about arginine as well. Okay, so the big four with regards to, and this applies to really any of the growing felids, um, is metabolic bone disease, thiamine or vitamin B1 deficiency, copper deficiency, and uh, vitamin A deficiency or hypovitaminosis A. All right, so I'm going to discuss those four, and those are the big four. Um, they the, they have really overlapping, um, in most cases, you don't get a pure thiamine deficiency, although it does occur, but very often, often it's all four at the same time. Sometimes one will feature a little bit more than the others, and, you know, and it, sometimes depending on the dietary history, you can get an idea that it's going to be one rather than the others. But very often, if they've fed a muscle meat diet after weaning, then all four of these develop almost simultaneously. Okay, um, and sometimes it, it's not in those cases worthwhile trying to figure out which one or trying to do a whole bunch of tests because by the time you get the test results back, the animal's already dead or has severe, um, you know, either neurological or, or bone abnormalities which are then um, impossible to correct. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the ch cheetah of milk formulas um, in terms of um, hand rearing. <coughs> um, not sure what you still using Esbilac? Yeah. Okay, so uh, in general, cheetah milk itself from the mother has been analyzed, and it is actually much higher in fat and in protein um, than domestic cat milk. Uh, practically, it probably doesn't make a huge difference when we're hand rearing cubs, although if we could create the ideal um, milk formula, um, 
And it's kind of one thing I still haven't really actually done yet because it involves actual working with actual food components, not just uh, um, you know vitamins and minerals. That makes it a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> but anyway, um, but uh, lower carbohydrate uh, content than cat milk. Carb those carbohydrates would be in you know lactose um, and things like that, so slightly lower lacto lactose content. Okay, so normally we'd feed roughly about 15 to 20 percent of body weight per day. Um, in, in uh, you know, that can be a little bit difficult to determine because that's you know you measure the weight or the volume of the something you feed, but you have to make it up at the right concentration. Um, so I tend to rather work on a different calculation, uh, which is 70 times body weight um, in kilograms to the power of 0.75 times three. And then that works out in the number of kilocalories that I have to work out per day. I mean, and, and for most of these that have the right sort of formulation, I mean, it does work out. I mean, that would work out, you know, as I said, you know, do that. Um, if the milk formula then contains 1.3 kilocalories per mil, then you kind of can calculate that's 110 mils of formula per day, which then if you roughly look at a six, in, the, in this case, I used a 600 um, gram kitten uh, or, or uh, a cheetah cub, um, Roughly, it works out to about 20% anyway of the, just under 20% of the body weight. Right, so that formula is very, very helpful. I mean, if you're just working on that, obviously as they're growing, you've got to recalculate um, the amount that they've got to get. And you've got to divide that up into number of feeds um, because the, you, there's another calculation or a, a formula that I could have for the actual st the stomach volume. But um, I don't often use that. I mean, if you just divide it up in, in initially into f six feeds, uh, when they are in the first few weeks, I mean, a couple, a couple of weeks, and then you can drop it down to four four feeds, and then you can drop it down to, some, you know, eventually after four weeks, you can drop it down to two feeds. I'm not sure what your sort of protocol is, but it obviously works quite well. But that's roughly, I think, the same yeah. as we do. Yeah. Adjust the diet every day. Yeah. And I think that's the ideal way to, to do it. Now, I'm just going to say a little bit about um, my opinion on, on like, hand rearing uh, and pulling cubs. Um, so... Um, and I've worked now quite a lot with Kango where that's a standard practice and there's a lot of criticism around the actual pulling of, of the cubs and hand rearing of them. Um, one thing with hand rearing, as soon as you hand rear, you, you're setting yourself up for potential nutritional deficiencies because your risk is much, much higher on hand rearing. You're not getting the, the milk from the mother, so you've got to know what you're doing when you're doing it. But the, the benefit for me that I've, and that I've seen is just that these animals are so much more... Um, compliant when it comes to working with them. Okay, they're already tame, habituated. If I want to um, anesthetize any of his animals, I give him the, the drug and he hand injects them. Okay, and there's no darting involved. If we want to put a uh, front line or change the, the tick and flea collar, you can apply it. Now that obviously depends on what the purpose of the animal is in the long term. If you're going to potentially release the animal into the wild, then that's a whole different story. Now, people will say to me, yes, but what about the, you know, the stress to the mother that's going to have cubs removed at 10 days? Well, in the wild, I mean, in Serengeti, they're just going to lose three quarters of them anyway to lions and anything else. So that's going to cause stress to her in the wild. And maybe they you know, should stop them being so stressed in the wild. I'm not sure. But, you know, the problem is that those are short-term short stress. Now, if you compare that stress to the lifetime stress of an animal that has to be darted because every time it has to have, be moved or it has to be darted every time it has to undergo some sort of medical examination or any sort of treatment, then I think the two balance each other out. And especially in those sort of situations where those animals are used for display purposes, they're never going to be released back into the wild, and that is their primary function. Then I, 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 I will tend towards the argument that it actually is really beneficial to have those animals as habituated as possible. Um, you know, but the, obviously that depends on, on what your ultimate purpose is of, of actually um, doing it. But as I said, you then need to know really what you're doing with regards to the actual, um, uh, f you know, hand rearing formulation and, and so on, especially once you bring them off the actual, you know, milk um, and, and start weaning them. <clears throat> um, because then this provides an enormous amount of calcium to them um, in the form of the milk, and you've got to find somewhere between the transition uh, where they are able to start eating bones and, and other sources of calcium, um, uh, you know, when they don't have the teeth in the mouth necessarily to be able to, to chew the, the bigger bones. In terms of which formulation, milk formulation um, works at the moment, I mean, a lot of people like to start them on the Royal Canin kitten uh, milk. Um, 
the problem is the expense. It's really quite expensive to do that. And especially if you carry the volumes that you're going to require, I mean, it's going to be very expensive towards the, um, you know, when they're four or five weeks old and they're still drinking quite a lot. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's quite expensive to do the kitty milk. That's the, the one from Chiron. That's fine. Um, Chiron brought out a, uh, and then Esbilac, which I think is still uh, the one that is most cost effective. It's not entirely without its problems. I um, mean, you can sometimes get a little bit of, in initial periods, you can get a bit of diarrhea or even a bit, bit of constipation um, in, the little, in the initial phases. But it seems to be a very short-term uh, problem, and you just have to get the dilution correct. You know, change the dilution if you're getting a bit of constipated, put a bit more water in with it, and, um, and so on. Um, with it, I'm not sure what the, the ratio is that you, you, Craig will probably have a better idea. Yeah, we actually just monitor the cups and just look at the fecal consistency. And uh, we would generally never do um, more than one to three parts. One to, one to so three one parts, to three yeah. Maybe one to two parts, but we, we often find the constipation. Yeah, then you just can, and I think you can go up to one to four parts. I mean, even if you really had a, a serious constipation, you know, event, and then drop back to one to one to three and parts. You can, depending on on the on the on the consistency and and if they're constipated, you add more water, and if they have diarrhea, you you you, yeah. you drop it so that you you make it more concentrated. Yeah. Yeah, you can once off. You just don't want to make that um, a, a, you know repeated habit. Yeah, yeah. Cause then rather adjust the water content, you know, to to adjust that um, the fecal consistency as well. Yeah. Um, then Chiron has produced a lion milk replacer um, uh, a few years ago, and then we ran into all kinds of problems with that. I mean, not in cheetah specifically, I think it was in, in lions. And then they sent me the formulation, and I had a look at the formulation, and oh, I mean, the one, the biggest problem with it was that the, the major copper deficiency that was in in their milk replacer. And um, so we adjusted the copper levels, and I, I'm not sure. I think they've got a, the, the new formulation is now. Uh, I, I adjusted that, and I adjusted several other things that were not quite 100% um, right. So I'm not sure how they did the initial formulation, but it was the blatant thing was that there was going to be a massive copper deficiency. Um, and you can imagine if you, you know, would you have a few cases like that as well with the yeah. copper? Yeah. Um, but when did you change the formulation about dialogue? About six months ago. Yeah, and then they came back to me, and then they had a bit of a problem because they said that the iron, I mean, the black, there were black, black sediment, you know, that was, and then they said, can't they take the iron out? And I said, no, you can't take the iron out. <laughs> they need iron to make blood cells, you know, and everything else in the body, and so you can't just take it. You've got to find a different salt, iron salt that will be that will dissolve in the actual formulation. So they've had some problems, you know, with trying to formulate the lion one, and I think the lion one would be perfect, perfectly fine. If we get the formulation right, I wouldn't test it on cheetahs first, just test on the lions first. And then if it works well in the lions, then I would. It, 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 there's no reason why it won't work quite well, I think, in cheetahs as well at some stage. Maybe a cost per victim. Yeah, no, it was about six months. No, they must have, the, they, they're already using the new stock. Yeah. Mm. Mm. No, it's a it's a lion milk formula. Yeah, so it's a lion cub, um, you know, uh, 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 milk replacement formula. Yeah, that that they used, that they that they're producing now. Yeah, yeah. But they should have the new formulation, and I haven't spoken to them in a while to find out whether you know whether they've had any other feedback on it or not. But at this stage, yeah, I said Espilac is is um, well tested in in many, they use it around the world um, as as a, it's. And I think that that's not the that's the puppy one actually, hey? Yeah, it's not the KM. It's a, there's a kitten milk formula, KM V or KM something like that, um, which is that they actually have a kitten one. But that you know again would be cost, uh, you know, prohibitive if you had to use it as well in in most cases. Okay. So as I mentioned, some of these things, the high risk of nutritional deficiencies, the advantages of habituation. So normally the cubs are left with the mother for seven to 10 days, and that mainly is so that they get sufficient colostrum. I mean, it really becomes very important that they get those first few days, the initial milk from the mother, to get the colostrum to give them some level of um, maternal immunity. Normally we would wean them on, start weaning them onto solid food at a roughly about six weeks of age. Um, I don't know how young you start the meaning in yours. We start already at about four weeks. Four weeks. Small, small mitts, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
they are too young to consume bones at that stage, and that really becomes the real problem. So you've either got to carry on with the milk, knowing that that's your only calcium supply that you're going to be giving them, um, if anything, everything else, unless you're providing some sort of uh, bone meal powder um, to, to the actual uh, meat as well, which I suppose you could also do. But the advantage simply is to use something that's a lot safer to use, um, that's not going to have any of the bacteria potentially in, in bone meal powder, would be just, just to use a calcium um, supplement. So I make just the, a, a very standard calcium carbonate and calcium diphosphate, uh, supplement which can be then added to that initial weaning period before they go on to actual bones. Mm. Have we ever had to take a cup away? Yes. What we've done previously is at six weeks we start making the chicken milk smoothie. Yes. Uh, mm. it, yeah, it goes through the bones and everything. And yeah. We still add some of the milk in place to then water into that. Yes. And then from there, yeah. Yeah, so you've just got to make some plan to get yourself a very small, because they, they will digest the, those, the, the really small pieces of, of bone, and they're certainly not going to get stuck in the intestine, which is your big worry. I mean, for me, often the, the problem is that um, people give them chunks of bone, and that's the worst thing. If you've got a piece of meat that's kind of, you know, where you've had processed bones, they've been chopped up into smaller pieces. And these cheetahs, I mean, the way that they eat in the wild is they chop off a bite off of a chunk and they swallow the whole thing. So they'll swallow that whole bone, but because they don't have the digestive enzymes yet to digest the bone, they, that ends up getting stuck in the intestine. And then you, that, that's a major problem. I mean, then you've got to do surgery to remove a, a piece of bone and so on. So it's a, it is an issue. But yeah, whatever you, you know, if that's fine. And um, you just have to, uh, I will do the calculations, which I will now get to metabolic bone disease, show you just how much bone they need. It's, it's actually frightening how much bone they need because they grow so fast. Um, you know, that they need a lot of, of, of calcium. Um, and it actually can be quite difficult to meet the requirements. This table over here is just um, to show you um, just some of the calculations that I was doing initially. Um, and um, you don't need the details, but what I want to just show you is that on the left-hand side in the first, well, the second column there, you've got a content of one and a half kilograms of beef. And then I've got a whole bunch of nutrients, which I've done the calculations. And then I've added a supplement, which in this case is the predator supplement, used very widely in South Africa. And then I've worked out the total and then the estimate requirements. And then uh, calculated based on uh, cat diets. I mean, because we don't have um, actual requirements for... Yeah. No, just, for this, just, just this is for an adult. Adult, okay. So it, it's actually made slightly worse when you start looking at uh, some of the parameters for, for growing animals. But then I've calculated the percentage deficit, deficit or excess over here. And what you can see is a number of these are actually in red. And there's some that are, I mean, you know, quite frightening. One of them is vitamin B1 or thiamine, where despite the fact that we're still providing a supplement, a predator powder, okay, we're still sitting with a 73% um, deficiency. Um, so you're fooling yourself a little bit if you, you know, using the tra uh, traditional, you know, supplement and thinking that you're going to be solving all of the, the potential problems here. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that I formulated is based on, on this to correct that um, so that none of these are in excess or, or deficiencies. But this gives you an idea how difficult it can be. So the first one of the big four is metabolic bone disease. I mean, it's a, a, I mean we can talk about rickets. We can talk about, use other words, osteoporosis, osteomalacia, um, uh, nutritional parathyroid uh, or hyperparathyroidism. I mean, there are lots of names for the same thing, but I prefer to just use the, the general term metabolic bone disease. We've already talked about some of these issues. Skeletal muscle is very, very low in calcium. So, I mean, one figure that you can remember if you want to is just that calcium in the diet on a dry matter basis needs to be 1%. 1% of the diet needs to be calcium. Okay, and that's calcium as a, a um, you know, calcium carbonate already has got a carbonate molecule. So you have to look at the elemental calcium. 1% of it has to be elemental calcium. Now, if you look at um, muscle meat, it's sitting there at 0 0.02 to 0 0.03. So it's about 50 times too little calcium in, if you just look at muscle meat on its own. Um, and if you look at the calcium to phosphate ratio, the ideal for growing animals is about 1 point, anything from about 1.5 to, to 2 parts calcium to 1 part uh, phosphate. And the ratio is completely inverted in um, muscle meat in that it uh, at, at best is probably around 1 part calcium to 20 parts phosphate. 
Okay, so that factors, and then the other additional thing is that muscle meat itself is generally low in vitamin D3 as well. So all those combined, and we end up with a, a real uh, problem uh, where these animals are not able to synthesize um, vitamin D3 from 7-dihydrocholesterol as well. Okay, that's the m typical diet also with a, m with a mincemeat in captivity or, you know, these larger pieces of bone where they're often not able to consume the bone and they only eat the muscle meat. This is just a table to show you some of the other the components that we often put in, in diets. Um, and you'll see that, uh, I mean, Hill's main, this is feline maintenance, has got that, that calcium percentage of just over one. So that's perfect. Um, the right calcium to phosphate ratio. Okay, but nobody could afford to feed that to cheetahs and it would give them diarrhea anyway. So that's not what we're going to do. Um, the red things, you can see that the, most of those other things, uh, tuna, which is uh, obviously, I mean, we wouldn't feed tuna to a cheetah either, but just in case you wanted to, it, you're going to end up with a major problem with, um, uh, with regards to the inversion of that ratio, 1 to 49, you know, 1 part calcium to 49 parts um, phosphate. And then just to point out that mature whole chicken, um, so that would be the chicken that you would feed, you'd still for, uh, get a, a calcium percentage that actually is slightly too low. Um, you know, not, it's not serious, but you, even with all the bones and everything that you've got in there, you're still getting below that 1% of diet. And the reason for that is simply because of the proportion of muscle meat. Um, because your broiler chicken just contains, you know, uh, a lot more muscle meat relative to the carcass weight, um, you know, compared to other things. Um, but you've at least got the correct calcium to phosphate ratio. So you really, you know, it's unlikely to then manifest in major problems, um, especially in adult animals. In, in young animals, you might have to add a bit more calcium to, to get up that, that, that calcium concentration. And then uh, day-old chicks, just because they're not fed to cheetahs, but they're often fed to other things like serval and caracals and so on. Um, and they're fine, but again, you, this is an immature skeleton in a day-old chick, so it doesn't have proper calcification in the skeleton, so you don't get anywhere close to the, you're about half the calcium that is required. The calcium to phosphate ratio, not too bad, but again, for a growing animal, that would be a, you know, potentially a problem. The clinical signs and the classic clinical sign that we see and that the way that I differentiate it often from any of the other um, deficiencies that we're going to talk about is pain. Okay. Copper deficiency is not painful. Vitamin A deficiency is not painful. Thiamine deficiency is not painful. Metabolic bone disease is very painful. Okay. It involves many of the long bones. There's usually a lameness or reluctance to move. You often end up with multiple fractures, um, <clears throat> sometimes collapsing of the pelvis. I was dealing with a lion um, last week where I could only get two fingers in the rectum in the pelvic canal. That's, that's how wide its pelvic canal is and in a, an adult male lion. And this because the whole one side of the pelvis had kind of collapsed in. There's no fracture, it's just the bone bends and then it solidifies in that position. And that obviously is a problem for a female that wants that needs to reproduce because she will never get a cub out of that uh, through that pelvic canal, and in a male, uh, well, male and female, it could result in chronic constipation, which is exactly what this lion had. Um, really, problems with with um, defecating. Um, any anything that just causes slight constipation and you get a buildup, um, and then it's impossible for them. Then you have to do an enema, and it's a, a real pain. Um, Dental wear and fractures, bowing of the long bones. Okay, so we get, um, you know, this this line was also funny because its whole front leg is like bowed like that. So it's it's um, quite dramatic. But that same thing can happen. Copal uh, deformities in, in cheetahs we see very often. And then on in terms of the blood, we only see an elevated um, alkaline phosphatase level, um, which is a you know, enzyme that's produced in bone in the liver. And then parathyroid hormone levels would also be higher than normal. The serum calcium in these animals is often, if you measure calcium in the blood, it's pointless. I mean, it's normally absolutely normal. And the reason for that is these, these animals do everything to maintain calcium in the blood at a, at a normal level. Because calcium, if it drops, then they're going to start going into tetany. And you don't actually see tetany in, in primates where, where this, with the same problem, metabolic bone disease, they often do, become, do develop hypocalcemic tetany where they start shaking because of a very low blood calcium level. But, you, you know, the, the calcium levels in the, most of the felids remains absolutely normal. Um, and it doesn't tell you anything about total body calcium at all. And then you can measure 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D, and normally you'll see that if it's, it's less than 20 uh, nanograms per mil. There are, are labs that will run it. But again, the problem is that you usually don't need the laboratory result to tell you that um, it is helpful, though, just to gauge how much vitamin D you're dosing if you, 
you know, but I think I've really got a fairly good idea of how much needs to be given in order to um, not end up with, a, with an excess. This is a cheetah that came four month old um, that, that uh, I treated. Um, again, this is a classic history where the animal was weaned from uh, a normal you know, replacement formula or um, taken away from, uh, I can't remember, but it was put onto a mincemeat diet and this took two weeks to get like this from that, from a healthy cheetah to a cheetah that had these bowed front legs and actually had a generalized dermatophytosis or a fungal skin, you know, like, like a ringworm all over its body. I mean, the entire surface of its body was covered um, because of the, uh, you know, the malnutrition that, that resulted from, from the, the mincemeat diet. But this cheetah came right. I mean, they, they, they do come right. You have to treat them aggressively right from the start. Um, and they need to get back onto the, the correct diet quickly. So this often is what we see is the deformity in the front limbs. Um, in cheetahs, it particularly seems to affect the actual growth plates um, on the long bones. So the radius ulna, the, the, just above the wrist, if you like, and they then get these deformities there. Yeah. You, you, would, you call this rickets, yes. I mean, that's, rickets is just a human term often just used for um, young animals that don't get enough calcium or vitamin and or vitamin D3. Yeah. Um, and then we call these angular limb deformities, um, but they are essentially uh, due to um, a lack of calcium or a lack of vitamin D3. And in my opinion, the vitamin D3 is probably less of important. It's the calcium that's the, by far the big, biggest um, role player in the in the diet although you can't neglect the vitamin d3 but but um, um, it it's often calcium more responsible um, this is the same case that we'd had sort of uh, fractures yeah you can see in this uh, case you can see the collapse of the pelvis the pelvis is collapsing on one side okay this one uh, you'll recognize perhaps okay so this is um, Free-ranging cheetahs, interesting um, situation, which had six cubs down in the Western Cape. And the smallest male um, of the group uh, actually developed um, metabolic bone disease. Um, interesting one, because this is a wild cheetah. The mother is hunting and uh, has access to springbuck. Um, and my theory about this case was simply that calcium was the, the limiting factor in the, in the whole thing. Um, the only source of calcium for the cubs this age, which still they probably just just start to eat some of the bones, but most of the calcium that they're getting is still from the mother's milk. With six cubs, some females will not be able to produce enough milk to be able to meet the calcium demands. Now, these cubs will be hunting with her or, or sharing on the carcass that she's eating on, but they will then not be able to eat the bones. They'll get muscle meat or they'll get soft tissues that so they get the energy so they don't look like they're starving. Um, but at the same time, they're developing multiple limb you know, um, pain and fractures, uh, and this even in a wild setting. Okay, so it shows you that they're probably limited to that five or six cubs purely by the fact that their mother is not able to produce enough milk. Um, and that's why most of them, but I mean, there are, there, there are case wild cheetahs that have got up to five cubs and raised them completely up to adulthood. Um, but there will be a differences in the amount of milk that the mother is able to produce and the amount of calcium that's the limiting factor that is uh, being able to be provided. So this one comes from your place, your little fella that's still with you at the moment. And you can see the slight angular limb deformity that, that's present over there. The distal radius ulna, you can see thickening of these. This is the growth plates in there. They're really, really thickened. Um, and this is what we call the Salter Harris type uh, one fracture, where you get just instability at the level of the um, growth plate. Um, it doesn't look like an obvious fracture, but there's a um, quite a lot of inflammation around that area, and then you can see quite a lot of callus formation around here, where you can see the bone, the body desperately trying to stabilise that area on the bo on the on the bone, and that will affect some of the joints um, potentially below, so this wrist or the carpal joint or the actual elbow joint above, um, and, and in some cases it may end up with um, you know requiring some surgery uh, to try and correct some of those bone abnormalities. This was just the hind leg again. It's not a great uh, picture here, but it was taken with a camera from a screen. But yeah, you can see a lot of inflammation again. This is also the distal tibia, um, where there's uh, quite a lot of instability as well, very common. And the same little uh, chap also had a major problem with uh, d damage to his uh, deciduous teeth, so the temporary teeth in the mouth. And you can see here that we have got um, quite a few 
uh, fractures of the teeth with exposed root canals. Okay, so those our teeth are now open, the nerve is, is in there and exposed. It's going to cause quite a lot of pain when he's trying to eat. Okay, the, those teeth are quite weak. Um, there's not enough calcium to maintain the dental uh, um, structures. Um, and then what happens is bacteria starts getting into that root canal, and then you get a massive, massive gum reaction um, over here, bacterial infection in the mouth, and then this guy is really not able to, to eat. So those teeth, those temporary teeth all need to come out, well, and, and that's what we did. Um, colleague down in, in the Western Cape removed all of the temporary teeth, and that will also allow the permanent teeth then to erupt, um, and that dramatically improved the situation with regards to his eating. Okay, so calcium, normal intake in most species, we talked about the 1% of dry matter, um, just to give you some calculation, one kilogram of meat, I mean, if you make biltong, you know that you out of one kilogram of meat, you get about 300 grams of biltong. That's because dry matter, it's roughly about 300 grams. Okay, and that means that you need about three grams of calcium in there. Um, we haven't done too many studies on cheetahs in terms of calcium requirements, but for a Great Dane puppy, a Great Dane around here, reaches a similar size to a, a cheetah, maybe a little bit more, but still roughly they need about six grams of calcium per day at peak growth, which is around 20, 20 weeks. Uh, and, it, you know, remember that Great Dane will take about two years to get adult uh, weight and this, you know, so 60 kilograms. Again, I think as humans, we don't quite realize how much this is because we, we grow to 60 kilograms or 90 kilograms in 20 years, you know, 15 or 20 years takes us to get that size. These animals do it, in the case of the lion, they're getting double that to 180 kilograms in three years. So it's a massive amount of growth that needs, and, and a large proportion of that is, you know, the skeletal structure needs to be supported by, by calcium as the main mineral um, that gives it strength. So in lions, for example, if we have to estimate their calcium intake, um, it would probably be about 10 to 15 grams of calcium per day at peak growth. And that, if we had to equate it to just how much milk, and I only use it because milk, we can, don't ever give a lion cub cow's milk um, on its own, um, <clears throat> but it would be 12 liters of cow's milk per day just to maintain the calcium uh, um, yes, you know, um, amounts that they need. And that's almost you know, just under a half a kilogram of bones. So that's where the cartilage and marrow is, not dried bones, just you know, bones, almost half a kilo of bones that they would have to eat a day just to maintain, just to get enough calcium in. Okay. In the cheetah, that um, equates to, um, you know, a one kilogram of beef or horse meat will only provide 100 milligrams of calcium, and they need three to four and a half actual grams of calcium per day, so which would equate to about 100 to 100 grams, 150 grams of bones. Um, all right, so that peak growth, you know, roughly about eight, eight to 12 months of age. You know, so that's quite a lot. I mean, if you think. Um, you know, in terms of the amount of bone that is required. So that's why we, we, we tend to, um, you know, supplement them then with some form of calcium carbonate, but then you have to be careful that you don't just give pure calcium. So what we've now, what I've done with the calcium, calcium care is to try and uh, calculate how much phosphate is in the meat. There still actually is a deficiency of phosphate, despite the fact, uh, so you still have to add a little bit of phosphate to the actual um, supplement that you're going to give. In bone, it's perfectly balanced. I mean, you know, that's why I say bones are still the best way of, of supplementing calcium because you can't oversupply it. I mean, there's still, I know there's still some people believe you can oversupply, feed too many bones. And that if, if a dog has white feces, you know, because of eating bones, that it, it's now got a, a calcium surplus. They just simply don't absorb the calcium that they don't need. So it actually really is not a situation where you can actually oversupply, uh, you know, calcium. And it doesn't appear to affect many of the other minerals um, in the body anyway when you're feeding whole bones. But um, you can end up, if you feed pure calcium and you don't have um, additional sources of phosphate, then there can be a problem. So the calcium care is kind of balanced so that you've got a little bit of phosphate that's added, but then mostly it's calcium carbonate, which is, which is the main source of calcium. And then vitamin D3, um, as I said, it's less of a player when it comes to metabolic bone disease, but it cannot be ignored. Uh, you re roughly need 250 international units per kilogram of meat. The highest concentrations are mainly in the organ meats and fat. Uh, so the kidney and the liver have high concentrations of vitamin D3. And then you also get some in the blood and in the skin as well, but very, very little in the muscle itself. Um, just to give you some idea, beef kidney is, is about 1,000 international units per kilogram, so that's quite a lot, quite a good source of, of vitamin D3. Um, <clears throat> beef liver, 
um, quite a lot less and then beef itself the muscle meat quite low the only thing with fish oil supplements if you're using the original fish oil supplements they can contain quite a lot of, of um, vitamin d3 and you need to be a little bit careful not to overdo it um, I'm, I'm you know vitamin d3 i don't like over -sup supplying it and so we, we we don't just chuck it in as as i would i wouldn't worry about vitamin a for example but vitamin d3 i'm very careful of over supplying um, so you don't want to add it and and a vitamin d3 supplement and then overdo it okay for too long because you can get calcification of other tissues in the body including the kidneys and uh, you know um, heart and so on um, if you oversupply it okay so that was metabolic bone disease vitamin a deficiency we've talked a bit about this already in most so i'm going to go through this a little quicker um you know um, liver is probably the best form of vitamin a that you can provide or um, it's stored in the liver so uh, it's virtually absent in muscle meat and they are very common in felids particularly lions and cheetahs this is where we see vitamin a deficiency the most uh, I just want to show you the symptoms quickly. This cheetah walking with short little steps in the hindquarters and then sitting down. And reluctant to reluctant to stand. Particularly, they, they're quite happy to sit, but they don't want to stand. There's often swaying of the back hindquarters and just general hindquarter weakness. Now, I would only say that this is almost indistinguishable from copper deficiency in cheetahs. So you, on the, on the, purely on the actual clinical symptoms, they look identical. Copper deficiency looks the same as vitamin A deficiency. You could ex so there, there's no way that I can tell whether that's a copper deficiency or vitamin A, usually a combination of both, um, but it could be either of those. So the classic thing here, that cheetah's not been in a lot of pain, so it may not necessarily have any, it might have concurrent metabolic bone disease, but it's um, not that, that painful. It's just that it's weak and it wants to go and sit down quite quite quickly so swaying of the hind courses hind limb ataxia which is just you know um, imbalances in the and it looks like the back of the body is kind of moving separately from the front you know as if it, it's got its own brain you know tell it what it's to, what to do sometimes can get tremors or even seizures um, head tilts stargazing or sudden onset blindness those are things that tend to see in lions because in lions the pathology that we see with it in aid deficiency is quite different we see um, thickening of the skull bones which compression of the brain Okay, because of the vitamin A is required uh, for of the um, osteoclast function. Osteoclasts are little cells that break down bone. Osteoblasts build it up. But when the osteoclasts are not working, then, then you get thickening of the skull bone so much so that the brain cavity gets cramped and you get compression of the brain and particularly the cerebellum at the back of the brain can actually herniate right through the foramen magnum, which is the little hole in the back of the skull where the, where the spinal cord comes out. You can get part of the brain actually popping out through that hole into the spinal canal and that obviously has severe effects on the actual nervous function okay but in the cheetah the the, the actual main pathology that we see is in the spinal cord itself um, this is just another cheetah again now not, not on a leash but you can see again you can see the flopping down just the general weakness in the hindquarters can you come in and try and make them walk further just uh, watch a video of her yeah, I couldn't even get the, I, mean, I don't think they actually managed to get the cheetah back up again. <laughs> reluctant to move, you know. Um, but they don't appear to be particularly uncomfortable or painful. They're not lifting one leg or, pain, you know, limping, limping on any particular side. I don't think we ever got the cheetah to get up again, but anyway. All right, so <clears throat> the main lesion, as I said, in, is the spinal cord is um, uh, changes in the spinal cord itself, what we call syringomyelia. And dilation of the spinal the central canal there is some thickening of the skull bones as well and if i take a, a an x-ray of the side of the head and i can measure the thickness of that particular area right over there and it's thicker than four millimeters then i have got a good idea that this animal is going to have a vitamin a deficiency the problem again with vitamin a like many of the other things is actually very difficult to measure the blood levels of vitamin a because it doesn't reflect total body stores again the body pushes the vitamin a into the blood um, because it needs to maintain the levels in the, in the blood, but it doesn't actually reflect what's going on. You actually need to take a liver biopsy if you really want to measure the actual body stores of vitamin A in an animal and determine a deficiency, and that's quite invasive. So, and it's going to take you a while. You know, so we, if we suspect it, we'll start them on copper supplementation and vitamin A, and we'll use the dietary history as well to kind of get an idea what is the most likely cause, uh, if it's a combination or if it's just one or the other. So normally the intake should be around three and a half to five, seven and a half thousand international units, uh, or you can measure it in, in the units per kilocalorie. Highest concentration in liver and then kidney and very low levels in muscle. 
beef liver is potentially is, is particularly high and chicken liver actually uh, quite a lot lower but all of those forms of liver will actually contain sufficient amounts of vitamin A to meet their, their needs it's particularly if they've given you know sort of um, liver once or twice a week uh, again if you're thinking of that proportions we had 50 muscle 50 percent muscle meat uh, 30 percent collagen containing uh, and then 20 percent organ meat if you make that liver twice a week you you pretty much sorted for your vitamin a um, intake so you and if you don't do that and you're feeding other organ meats then obviously then you have to add a, the supplement you know to to make up the difference um, I was just going to say that because they excrete it in the form of retinal esters, it's actually really difficult. I know the literature is always telling me about vitamin A um, toxicity and, and um, you know, potential for it. And even if you read the IASA um, cheetah uh, uh, um, recommendations, they talk about vitamin A. You must be careful even feeding whole rabbit because it contains too much vitamin A. I, I, we just don't see any clinical signs, and we've, and I know that. You know, in certain cases, we've given them very high doses of vitamin A and they don't develop um, actual toxicity signs. So I'm not so worried about it. I think if you want to do it long term, you've got to be careful. Uh, but um, actual clinical cases and fractures from bones and, and other signs of vitamin A excess, we just simply don't see that. Um, so I'm not too worried uh, about, um, you know, going fairly high on the doses of vitamin A, especially in clinical cases where you've already seen a deficiency. In, in lions, we give them astronomical amounts of vitamin A when, when they've clinically ill, you know, and, and it reverses the, in, if we get them early enough, um, it actually reverses the clinical signs very nicely, um, those very high doses. If you go too low with the doses, then you don't see as good a response. Okay, then we're going to, the, the, so that's the first two. The third one is thiamine deficiency or vitamin B1. Um, again, the big problem is that it's very low in muscle meat uh, compared to um, other tissues in the body, particularly the organs. Um, and it can actually be a problem, and this is often a problem we've seen in uh, people that are on a keto diet or um, paleo diets or things where they're eating quite large amounts of, of fat, um, that the actual requirements for vitamin B1 go up quite, particularly if they're drinking alcohol at the same time. So high alcohol intake, high fat intake is a recipe for a thiamine deficiency. Um, so then you have to start taking some sort of su supplement here. Yeah. Yeah. You start getting numbing of your feet, you know, uh, that, you know, that tingling in your, in your feet, that's probably a vitamin uh, or B1 deficiency. So high fat intake can increase the requirements for thiamine. And then any felids with GIT disease, because uh, it can be broken down in the gut, um, and the gut can contain high levels of thiaminase bacteria. Um, Thiaminase is an enzyme that bacteria produce that breaks down the thiamine, and particularly in fish-eating carnivores, so the seals and things like that that we have, we almost always just give them a B1, you know, supplement right from the start because the the risk is so high for them. Uh, fish contains a lot of thiaminase bacteria, so that's that's why we would normally supplement them. And then, in my view, young caracal and serval, very very susceptible to B1 deficiencies. Uh, they. Um, the main neurological symptoms here, and this differentiated from everything else, is that you get central nervous system signs. So in that cheetah, you can see that cheetah, I mean, with potential copper or vitamin A deficiency, just its hind limbs that are not working. But it's still watching you and it still is completely alert and knows what's going on in, around it. B1 deficiency, they, because the lesion is in the brain itself, um, they... Uh, you know, really confused and they're falling all over and the front limbs are also affected. So you get a very clear idea that this is a B1 deficiency rather than they can have seizures, they can have anything that's related to the central nervous system rather than just the spinal cord. Um, yeah, acute blindness, again, because you get optic uh, neuropathy, peripheral neuropathies and so on. So that acute onset blindness can be either vitamin A or thiamine deficiency. The vitamin A uh, deficiency is because of, of the squeezing of the optic canals in the brain. So the, the thickening of the skull causes the optic nerve to be squeezed by the thickening of the skull bones in vitamin A deficiency, whereas, yeah, it's actual damage to the nerve function itself. And then you get necrosis in the brain, and actually this is amazingly reversible. So if you hit them with a bit B1 uh, high doses, within a day or two, they will respond very nicely to the treatment. They come right almost overnight. And that's another way in which we kind of distinguish between that and vitamin A will, deficiency will take about a week to two weeks to kind of correct. B1, two days max, otherwise there's some other problem, you know, going on. So, but as I said, they can co occur concurrently. 
Now this is a serval, a young serval with a, you can see this animal's really front limbs, hind limbs, head affected, uh, and really completely spaced out and struggling. Um, open mouth breathing, and really has no balance whatsoever. So this was a case of a, uh, or a suspected case of B1 uh, deficiency, and this animal responded very quickly. Within two days, this animal is virtually back to normal again, which is actually quite nice, very rewarding to see when you can do that. We have trouble with vitamin A deficiency. Is there any way that you inject the vitamin A Yeah. Yeah, there is a point where you can actually get some permanent damage, uh, you know, to the spinal canal, and then unfortunately you end up with um, permanent, uh, you know, some neurological deficits. There's in in, li in lions, or I mean, in, and in cheetahs, if you catch them, you know, pick it up, and the si signs are very subtle, very early on, and if you pick it up, then you can reverse it completely. Um, so then, but you got to you got to be careful that you don't, uh, you know, confuse it with a copper deficiency. And, and I, as I said, I would normally treat both at the same time because trying to send samples away to the lab is just going to take forever to get results and it's it's very difficult to diagnose that way yeah yeah uh, and, uh, the oldest white white uh, yes can, is it, uh, also that, can, can that be the uh, symptom of vitamin A it can be because, especially if, if the animal has got, again, uh, the white pupil can be that the retina is not responding to light, and that can be because the optic nerve is compressed, um, uh, you know, so, but it, it's, um, no. if there's no blindness, no. no, they can still see. Yeah, yeah. It goes, it, it, yeah. Uh, things and broaden, yes, okay, then. It's like, you know, it's like normal stage, it's like much larger than that. Yeah, that could also, it can also be due to the direct effect on the actual eye itself. And the rods and cones in the in the eye, but um, you know, that's not a common sort of symptom that I've seen. What we certainly see in lions more often is even actual seizures. You know, um, you know, they're very very common too. Oh, I'm mm. not, I'm not that it was a yeah, but it might might be a symptom. Yeah, yeah, it could be. <coughs> mm. Okay, so there are a number of injectables in acute cases. We we treat them with very yeah. So you're talking about seizures with uh, thiamine. You can get seizures with thiamine deficiency, absolutely, and with vitamin A deficiency. You know, so and the problem is that sometimes, the, you know, especially if thiamine deficiency has gone on for a few weeks, that that necrosis in the brain can then be a source of the actual or the cause of the actual seizures, and then sometimes then you can't do anything about it. I mean, you can treat them, and they might be mentally okay in between the seizures, but uh, already you've created there's an area that's dead in the brain that is then a source of the trigger for the actual seizures. So then, 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 they, then you've got to manage them with um, with phenobarb or one of the one of the anti-epileptic drugs, you know, and they have to be on it lifelong, you know. Then it's very difficult. Okay, so these these are just injectables, um, and then again, storage of meat maybe uh, maybe an issue because of those thiaminase bacteria. If there's contamination of gut material on the meat, um, that will reduce the amount of thiamine dramatically. Uh, so the temperature and hygiene fairly important, and then supplementation with at least five milligrams per kilogram of meat that is fed. Okay, and this is again one where I say that the predator powder particularly does it, it has about 1.5. I'll get I'll get the values up in one of the other later lectures or parts of the lecture, but it doesn't meet the actual uh, requirements so, of five milligrams per kilogram, and that's the that's the key problem with it you know so in adult animals it'll probably be fine and as long as they don't have a thiaminase bacteria issue then it, it will be okay but um, we'd still see cases of thiamine deficiency even with the predator powder can you give that injectable yes yeah it's it's well absorbed by any route yeah and yeah you just give it once a day? yes you give it once a day at okay. five milligrams per kilogram of meat yeah yes Split the dose morning and night. Yeah. It works actually better. better. Yeah. I, I yeah. It's probably also work better for for, 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 for cheetahs as well. Yeah. 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 Okay, then copper deficiency, and I'm not going to go into much detail. Copper is such an important um, element in the body in terms of so many different metabolic pathways, and I would say that majority of cases where we go deficiencies, we're not actually going to see obvious clinical symptoms in the short term. Um, so we usually have a very, very severe copper deficiency before we actually see 
symptoms. I mean, it plays an important role in collagen production in the body. And that, I mean, I don't know, I mean, I just included here in lions. Uh, I don't know if you've seen a lot of these young lions that develop these elbow hygromas, very large swellings over the actual... I, I suspect that's a copper deficiency that's causing that uh, because you've got a lot of connective tissue over the actual elbow with a lot of movement there. These lions can be on cement floors, hard floors, because the classic theory in dogs, large breed dogs with elbow agromas, is that they collapse onto hard floors and then they develop these little swelling, you know, like lump like swellings over the elbows. Um, they have a nightmare to deal with. But these lions are not on hard floors. They're often on grassy, in grassy enclosures, and then they develop these big, big swellings. I don't normally treat those swellings. I mean, they normally go down um, as the animals get older. Um, you know, unless they, you can drain them, but you run the risk of then introducing an infection into that, into that um, swelling. But um, I suspect that that's the case. In cheetahs, we don't see that. I mean, it's not a, a common, uh, or I've never seen an elbow hygroma in a cheetah before. Um, iron is, I mean, it's also together with iron required for hemoglobin, uh, production for a healthy immune system, for testosterone production, you need copper, um, efficient neuron signaling, and then very importantly, and this is probably the thing that happens in the cheetahs, is it's important for the myelin sheath, which is the thing that surrounds the little layer of, of tissue around this, the nerve cells. And when the myelin sheath is damaged or not developed properly, then you get uh, um, neurological problems, and particularly in the hindquarters. And we see that in sheep and pigs, we, we call it swayback uh, when they've got copper deficiency. They also develop very similar to the cheetah. They develop the same kind of, of weakness in the hindquarters. Um, and then you can actually, because of it, I mean, if in some other animals in, and in humans, you can actually get acute rupture of the aorta. Um, the collagen of the aorta it weakens because of copper deficiency, and then you can get actual um, rupture of the aorta, which obviously causes acute death. I mean, because they bleed out into their chest. Um, just spontaneously. So um, that the very rare. I've never seen it in any of the carnivores, but we see it in uh, some other species as well. And kudu, kudu with copper deficiency, I've seen them dislocate the shoulders, just completely rupture the entire shoulder joint uh, uh, from from a copper deficiency. These are usually captive ones. They're not free-ranging ones. These are captive ones that are being fed lucerne uh, as the main, uh, um, you know food for them, because lucerne is generally, depending on the area, is often copper deficient as, as well. Okay, so normally, yeah, uh, and this, so there is some important information. Yeah, uh, we want to target somewhere around five for, uh, to nine milligrams per kilogram of meat. Um, if you look at chicken, chicken meat, uh, ch in, in, in general, if you can take it, even a chicken whole carcass, probably going to be one to two milligrams per kilogram of meat. So you already know that you're way below that five to nine milligrams per kilogram. Chicken liver itself, if you had to just feed the liver itself, would provide an adequate amount of copper. But then you would have to feed chicken liver itself on its own with no, no other, you know, chicken components. The content in anything that, because chicken, again, they, they eat mainly, you know, um, uh, um, maize meal of some sort, whereas turkeys, geese, and ducks are often grazing and uh, 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 poultry, so they tend to have quite a lot higher copper levels. Um, Pigs, there you can see seven milligrams per kilogram. Pig liver, beef liver, 100 milligrams per kilogram. So you can see a massive jump in the amount of copper in a ruminant that's um, grass eating. So uh, in general, 50 to 90 grams per kilogram of total meat fed day, uh, per day would meet their needs. Um, and that's of, of beef liver I'm talking about there. All right. And a one-year-old cheetah uh, feeding about 150, 250 grams of beef liver twice a week. Uh, would provide enough copper and the vitamin A that it would re require. Okay, so that's beef liver, beef liver though. Just so five grams of uh, copper. So if you wanted to supplement the, them with copper sulfate, which is a uh, you can get injectable um, copper sulfate. You just have to remember that the sulfate component of the copper is about 75% of the molecule. So 20 milligrams of copper sulfate will only give you five milligrams of elemental copper. So that's why I recommend here using uh, copper sulfate at 20 milligrams per kilogram in, in, just injected into the meat. And I would only, only do that really if you have these, you know, um, severe cases that you want to kind of treat. But I mean, ideally, you just then provide them with a, a proper, you know, supplement that's got the correct copper in it. And then you don't have to give a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You just give them the one thing. Okay, and then the last one that I'm going to discuss, I've got a, just a couple more slides here and then we can have lunch. Taurine deficiency um, is talked about a lot, and a lot of people ask me about taurine deficiency. Um, 
I am yet to really see a case of classic taurine deficiency. Taurine deficiency normally causes problems in the eye and in the heart muscle, so you can get congestive heart failure, dilative cardiomyopathy, so where the heart enlarges and becomes weak. It's not really a common thing that we see in cheetahs, certainly, so it's not a, 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 something that I think is common. The reason why taurine deficiency is such, so talked about is when you, uh, if you cook any of the meat uh, or you process the meat with heat, um, often the taurine is leached out of the, the meat and then, um, you know, it very quickly is leached out. It, actually, all the water that you boil the meat in will contain lots of taurine and the meat itself will have virtually nothing in it. So when the North Americans produce a lot of, um, you know, domestic you know, diets for, for domestic animals, they suddenly end up with, with taurine deficiency and they had to then add taurine to the, to the diet. Um, and some of the North American zoo diets still are processed and they still have com commercial processed foods. And these obviously have to have large amounts of taurine added to them. But because we mostly feed muscle meat, in some sense, most of the muscle meat, um, said perhaps in chicken it's a little lower, but in the others, there certainly is enough taurine in most meat products to not um, ever end up with a deficiency. The only thing that I would say is that taurine is potentially broken down by intestinal bacteria. And so any of these cheetahs with gastritis and over small intestinal bacterial overgrowth could end up with a taurine deficiency. Uh, but as I said, we still don't see that clinically. So I still don't think it's actually a significant or a problem that I would be particularly worried about. And I only put it in there. So this was just a comparison between my own, uh, and this is now the panthera supplement, which is not the, the cheetah supplement that I have, but they are almost identical. Um, just uh, because the premium cheetah supplements got extra glycine added into it. Um, but otherwise, in terms of the proportions or the amount provided to the animal daily, they're almost identical to the panther one. Um, and I just wanted to show you, uh, so the vitamin A content in, in my supplement is at least double that, almost double that of the one in, in predator powder. The B1 concentration, and this is probably the most important one, um, is much, much higher, um, four times as high. And then, you know, probably, no, even, even more importantly, Pan, the predator supplement doesn't contain any copper at all. And so you then have to provide, you're going to have to get a complete separate copper supplement um, if you're going to, you know, be dealing with cheetahs, whereas, you know, with any of the, with either with the premium cheetah supplement or the panther supplement, you've already got it in there and you don't need to worry about it. And then, I mean, there are a few other differences in there as well. It doesn't provide any B5, it doesn't provide any manganese, it doesn't provide any um, sodium chloride. Okay. So that really is... That lecture uh, on, uh, I said the big four. There are a few other things that we can talk about. We're not going to get into some of the other lectures, but um, really those are the big ones that you need to be aware of um, and look out for. Um, and that normally if you get the, the diet right, I mean, whether you're using a, a, you know, a supplement that is really nice and complete or whether you're doing whole carcass. If you're in whole carcass, there's no point in supplementing. Because, and, you know, you're getting the liver... Um, and it depends again on what animal you're talking about, because as I said, if you've got a if you've got a um, game meat, particularly small antelope or antelope, and you're providing antelope liver, and then it's got more than enough, it will be comparable with bovine liver in terms of the copper and vitamin A that it's providing. So they will provide plenty, uh, you know, of those minerals. You just got to be aware of the calcium, though. Sometimes it it sneaks up on you, especially if you're feeding cheetah cubs larger things where they don't, where they can't consume that level of bone. Then you must make sure that you are actually providing um, the extra extra calcium. So what I generally do with ours is, is uh, you know, make it easy so that you don't have to become too confused. You be, you're just using either the premium cheetah supplement or the panther supplement, and um, if for adult animals, and then in anything that's growing, doesn't matter what carnivore you, you know, you're adding the calcium, uh, the calcium care. Um, supplement to it if you can't meet the, the, the requirement for bones until they're completely mature and then you just stop that and you just carry on with the, with the other supplements. So, so what? Do you be covering, uh, a lot of times farmers tell us and say that cow is dosing it with X, Y, or yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what the big no no is. Okay. Yeah, I actually didn't put that in there, but I will, I can easily talk about that. Yeah, there are, are a few important ones that you need to just stay away for, especially in cheetahs, yeah. yeah. It will, uh, just remind me that we talk about that at the end. Yeah, I can definitely do that. So, um, I'm in my baby. Yes. Baby. Yeah. Um, I gave, I'm still giving them extra calcium. Yes, yeah. So they're a year and a half now. Yeah, I'd go until, I'd, I'd keep going until two years, okay. and then, you know, then, but really almost all cheetahs by two years, they've reached skeletal maturity. They're not going to get grow anymore from there. 
it yeah. really straightened me. Yeah, the legs, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was just the one leg. Yes, bad. yeah. Yeah. It's really, I, I give it to both of them, even yes. the other one. Yeah, as I said, it's really unlikely that calcium excess in carnivores is going to actually cause any problems at all. I mean, if you think of these 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 hyenas, I mean, just sometimes they, they all they've got is bone and they eat a huge amount of it, and um, it doesn't cause uh, any other mineral deficiencies if they've got an excess calcium, uh, which everybody's worried about. It doesn't do it. You don't see it. They're fine, but you must remember that those bones are not properly calcified. They're obviously, I mean, they, there is some calcification, but you, you're going to end up with a slight calcium deficiency. You need to add a calcium supplement to that. No, no. As long as it's relatively fresh. I mean, the, the, the problem is that those can, uh, you know, the, the fetus can decay quite quickly um, if you don't, if it's not kept at the right you know, refrigerated, um, and if it's if there's any, you know, then then it's usually not too much of a problem. No. Yeah, I mean, there's I suppose there are some there's some risk of things like uh, um, brucellosis if there's you know a lot of abortion from brucellosis and that those car, those unborn fetuses, but I think most of those unborn fetuses are from abattoirs are simply from you know cattle that have been slaughtered and that are then pregnant at the time of slaughter. You know, so um, it's not usually abortions that you run around picking up you know to feed. Yeah. Yeah, and those are safe, safe to feed. They're usually not a, a big problem. As I said, you just be aware that you don't, those, um, depending on the age of the fetus, they're not necessarily well calcified, the bones. Um, you got some cartilage, yeah. No, absolutely, there's, there's, there's plenty of cartilage. Okay, let's have some lunch then.